guys. <clears throat> hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. I apologize. I'm running super late. Lots going on. Traffic was horrible. I was at the hospital. They found something else involving arthritis with my dad, but it's some weird thing. I don't know. They still got some tests to do. He's going to be at least be there at least one more day, possibly two. So I'm not going on our trip. My wife and my son are going to go. I want to stay here because he's probably going to need care. And I don't want to put that off on my mother. There she is right there. I don't want to put that off on my mom. She's 71. She's got health issues. You know, that's a lot to have to keep up with. So I'm going to stay here and I'm going to help. It's the responsible thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Give me just a second. Let me uh, let my mom know. I'll call her later. Okay. Um, yeah, we still don't know. I mean, his leg's looking a lot better where he had that hematoma. Uh, that's healing up pretty nice. Um, it's just, he's tired of being in there. He don't want to be in there no more. I don't blame him. But uh, they're taking good care of him. And so it's just a matter of time before he, uh, before they finally figure something out. We can't get any information from anybody. So basically it's hurry up and wait. So I'm staying behind. And that way I can do whatever it needs to be done, whenever it needs, needs to be done, uh, to help him out, help my mom out. There's all the grass needs to be cut again, so I'm going to stay here and cut that and, and get some other stuff done. And it'll just make the trip easier anyway, not having to take the dogs or anything like that. So, so there will be no interruptions in morning and evening devotion, I hope. Okay. It's funny because all this stuff is happening, and we know the Lord is fully in control of it. But how interesting we're going into a verse, 1 Thessalonians 2.18, where it says Satan hindered us. Evidently, Satan can hold us back. He can hinder us from things. So let's see what was going on. The whole verse says, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. Satan stopped Paul and the other people that was with him from going to see these people. So evidently, Satan can, can be allowed to do that. Satan can hold us back from certain things. I don't know how what that would look like or how, because Paul doesn't give the details, but it can happen. And uh, I very well, I'm very well convinced that that happens even more now, possibly, than what it did back then, because of the type of world that we're in. Look at how people are. You know, Satan sends people to harass us. He puts roadblocks in our way. I mean, look at Job. He was given permission to do everything to Job except take his life. And he did terrible things to Job and his family. Took them all away. So evidently he can do some things. And it, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that he can. Or that we may be witnessing some of it. I don't know where that is or, or when that is or how it happens. And I, don't, I can't even point at one simple thing and say, okay, that's him. I'm giving the Lord all the glory and get all the credit because he's in control. Because Satan can only do it if the Lord lets him do it. And it'll be for my better. It'll be for my good because I love him. That's what the Bible says. So let's get some context here and see what's going on. Um, two, three, four. I'm going to start here in verse 14. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their uh, and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men. These are Jews. We have a similar mentality today in Israel. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. That still happens today. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So this would be something that Satan would do or be allowed to do. Paul's longing to see them again. Verse 17, but we brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you. Even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. So Paul's like, 
look, we wanted to come. We see a lot happening. A lot of stuff's going down. We wanted to come. Satan held us back. Satan sent people. Or there's all kinds of stuff happening because of him. But you know what? What difference does it make? Where's our hope? Is it in Satan? Is it in uh, coming together and seeing each other physically? It, it, where's our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ where we all stand together? Though We talked about this, guys. Though we may not be able to come together here on this earth physically, there is a time when it'll happen in his presence. That's where our hope is. That's where our joy is. That's where our crown of rejoicing comes from. It's hoping when we get to stand in his presence. Not this life. The next one. So if we can't do it here, we'll certainly do it there. And that's where our hope has to be, where our joy has to be, and where our crown of rejoicing will come from. To know that there is a day coming when the Lord will return a second time for those eagerly expecting him, apart from sin, for salvation. Hebrews 9.28 he came for sin 2,000 years ago. He comes for judgment at the end of the tribulation, for salvation happens in between. That would be the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. It's right there in Hebrews 9.28. People say there's no third coming of the Lord. It's right there in Hebrews 9.28. It's right there. And it is encouraging. So let's get on to the thing about Satan. Satan hindered us. He held us back, stopped us from doing stuff, sent enemies. Since the first hour in which goodness came into conflict with evil, it has never ceased to be true in spiritual experience. That's Satan hinders us. From all points of the compass, all along the line of battle, in the vanguard and in the rear, at the dawn of day and in the midnight hour, Satan hinders us. If we toil in the field, he seeks to break the plowshare. If we build the wall, he labors to cast down the stones. If we would serve God in suffering or in conflict everywhere, Satan hinders us. He hinders us when we are first coming to Jesus Christ. Fierce conflicts we had with Satan when we first looked to the cross and lived. Now that we are saved, he endeavors to hinder the completeness of our personal character. You may be congratulating yourself saying, I think hitherto walked consistently, and no man can challenge my integrity. Beware of boasting, for your virtue will yet be tried. Do you think that God doesn't use evil to serve his will? Sure he does. It's all over the Bible. A lot of people today don't believe that. It's all over the Bible. All over it. And obviously, he uses Satan because we have stories like Job and others in the Bible of him using him to do his will. He used Satan when it came time for the Lord to die for our sins, Satan thought he was stopping him from doing it. Instead, facilitated it. What, a, what an insult. What a stab. Oh, you want to stop him? Cool, go ahead, kill him. And he did. And that's literally what the Lord wanted. See, Satan's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. Satan will direct his engines against that very virtue for which you are the most famous. And that is the truth. That is the truth. If you have been hitherto a firm believer, your faith will ere long be attacked. If you have been meek as Moses, expect to be tempted to speak unadvisedly with your lips. Yeah, I can relate to that. I've done that many times. The birds will peck at your ripest fruit, and the wild war will dash its tusks at your choicest vines. Satan is sure to hinder us when we are earnest in prayer. He checks our importunity and weakens our faith. In order that, if possible, we may miss the blessing. He doesn't want us to worship God. Don't give him what he wants, but instead, get up and do it. Nor is Satan less vigilant in obstructing Christian effort. There was never a revival of religion without a revival of his opposition. As soon as Ezra and Nehemiah began to labor, Sanballat and Tobiah were stirred up to hinder them. What then? We are not alarmed because Satan hindereth us, for it is a proof that we are on the Lord's side and are doing the Lord's work, and in his strength we shall win the victory and triumph over our adversary. Amazing. So, when Satan comes, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, because it tells us 
We're working for the Lord. We're doing things for the Lord. If you're you're in some form of ministry and nothing ever goes wrong and nothing ever happens and everybody claps you on the back and says, great job, nobody ever attacks you, anything like that, that's not a good sign. It's not a good sign. The Bible makes that clear. It has verses talking about that very thing. Be aware when men speak well of you. Because the world loves its own. See, Satan doesn't have to go after the unbelieving world. He doesn't have to go after those that are going the wrong direction. They're already headed where they're going. He goes after those that are headed the right direction. So an example of this, uh, let me paint a picture. We're, we're paddling upstream to go to the source of the water, Jesus. He puts rapids in the river. He sends rain for a flood. Rocks, brambles, tree limbs growing over the water. Shallow water, sandbars, anything to try to stop us, our upward movement. Same thing with climbing a hill or a mountain. I'm going up to the top where the Lord is. I'm working my way there. Everybody's taking the easy road. I'm taking the hard road. I'm crawling up to the Lord. Bears, bees, bugs, snakes, some more of those brambles. Trees, storms, winds, gales, you name it. The Lord will do everything he can. Or Satan will do everything he can to try to stop you. And the Lord helps you. <clears throat> About the time Satan thinks he's won, the Lord reaches out and takes your hand and goes, Not yours, mine. You come up here with me. You, go ahead. You, you can go on. He, 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 he doesn't let us fall victim completely and be utterly cast down. What did God tell him in, in Job? You can, you, can, you can do this, but don't touch his person. And so he took away his wife and kids, he took away all the, that he had, had to send a tornado to wipe out, out everything and destroy it all. People came, stole a bunch of stuff, and he had nothing. Oh, well, look, he's still hanging on. Well, you know, strike him with an illness. You can, you can do everything but kill him. And so Satan went after him and did everything but kill him. But God did not let him fall. In fact, at the time where he might have stepped over the edge, much to the, you know, due to the discouragement of his three supposed friends, he sends somebody to speak on his behalf and then arrives himself. You three, pound sand. You, Thank you for saying what you're saying and, and doing what I told you to do. Joe, get up. Cinch up your belt. Put on your shoes. We got to go talk. Let's go get some stuff done. And what did he do? Made him double what he was before. So walk in faith. We know this, is stuff, this stuff is going to happen. We know that these things are going to unfold. We know that there's always going to be roadblocks and obstacles and obstructions every time. We get smooth stretches and then everything gets rough again. I remember way back, it's not like this anymore, uh, way back when we were doing, I was early teenager, and we were doing a lot of a lot of traveling back and forth. Work was hard to find, there was a, a recession going on, and uh, so we were going back and forth between Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas a lot. Uh, I, it was weird, it's a weird story, lots of, lots of, lots of stories. Anyway, um, Texas prides themselves on their roads. Back then, you could tell when you left Texas without ever opening your eyes. If you were asleep or just laying there with your eyes closed in the seat. You could tell when you exited Texas because instantly the roads got terrible. And Oklahoma, all the roads used to be the old concrete slabs. And so when you drove down the highway, of course, the back speed limit at that time was 55. So it was a slow trip. It took a whole night to get through Oklahoma. And it was da dun da dun da dun Dun, 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 dun. And then when they raised the speed limit to 65, when I got a little older, then it was dun, 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 for a couple hundred miles. You were ready to get out of the car when that came. In fact, a lot of times you you'd make it to big cabin and get out and take a break because your ears were ringing because you're hearing that of the tires hitting those rib ribs in between the slabs. It was horrible. Finally, they've redone their roads, and it's a lot better now. But man, so the path we walk 
to that narrow gate is going to be strewn with all kinds of issues. But this is what builds character. This is what builds faith. This is what reinforces faith and integrity. Hope in the Lord and something better. You know, I, I always get this picture in my head when I read through certain scriptures that the Lord is trying to, to separate our ties from this world because when the time comes to go, you don't want to be looking back or, well, what about this person? What about that person? They'll be fine. The Lord's got under control. Lord, I'm going with you. I don't know if we're going to have to make that decision. I don't think so because the Bible says it'll be just like that and instantly we're gone. It's going to be so quick, nobody's going to even know that it happened or until after the fact. But... <clears throat> He's trying to, someone's life has to be hard to cut those apron strings, to cut those ties, to cut those things that hold you to this world. Well, I want the Lord to come, but I don't want to give this up yet. I don't want to give that up yet. He's cutting those, those ties so that when the time comes, we've got nothing tying us to this world. And so the best way to do that is to make this world as uncomfortable as possible, to make this environment uncomfortable. So much so that we will desire him and his kingdom more than we will desire this life. I think most of us are at that point. Well, sure, there's things we have to deal with. I'm dealing with family and health issues and everything. We just literally got done with my mother-in-law dying. My dad's now sick. He's looking better, but who knows? He's in his 80s, so who knows? Um, and, and it gets daunting sometimes. It gets discouraging sometimes. It gets frustrating sometimes. But there's nothing you can do. You can't control it. So why worry about it? Jesus said, if you can add an hour to your life, why worry about anything else? If you can't make yourself one cubit taller, why are you worried about anything else? Don't worry about it. I'll deal with it. You just do what I gave you to do. And so even though we have these obstacles, we climb over them and keep going. We push through and keep going. No matter what Satan tries to do to stop us, we do not give him what he wants and don't give him the attention he's looking for. Because that means we would have to take it away from our Father in Heaven, but instead focus on our Father in Heaven. What did Jesus say? When you see these things begin to happen, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Why did he tell us to look up? Because when we look up, you can't see. See, if you look straight forward, you can see through your peripheral vision. You see what's going on around you. You look up, you look up. Only a little bit of your peripheral works. But you don't see very much because you're focused on what's going on above you. Looking up takes our focus off of this and puts it on him. He's talking about a spiritual looking up. You know, go outside and stand up and stare at the sun. You'll go blind. He's talking about a spiritual looking up. Stay focused on heaven. Stay focused on what's waiting for us. Not this life. This life is what it is. It's not permanent. It's only for a very short time. What is this life to eternity? Now, I'm going to share with you guys. Some of y'all know this. I've shared it a couple of times. But I've got a lot of new people on the channel. And y'all may have never heard this before. There was a TV show a long time ago. And it had Dan Aykroyd playing a, a preacher. And his son. And this is, this is an example. This life. We know how long this life is. This is an example of this life compared to eternity. His son asked him, Dad, how long is eternity? And Dan Aykroyd's character knelt down. And he said, Son, imagine a brass ball. 200 miles across. Now imagine that every 10,000 years, a dove flies by and brushes that ball with the tip of its wing. He said, when that ball is ground to dust, that'll be the beginning of eternity. What is this life compared to that? What is this life compared to when we are 20 million years, of course, in, in heaven, there is no time, 20 million years into eternity. What is this life compared to that? When we are still with the Lord and still enjoying his company and still experiencing him and each other and the Father and everything that's waiting for us up there. See, we always, we're so short-sighted as humans, we never can see more than just a few feet in front of us. Most people, they're, the world that they're aware of is a 10-foot circle around them and that's it. Anything that enters that, then they focus on it. We're supposed to have our mind on spiritual things, on heavenly things. The Bible tells us to do that. And so that means i got to think about eternity. I'm not going to think about a single point in time. I'm going to think about all of it. And what's waiting on the other side, this is the transition to that. 
And so if this life has a lot of roadblocks, so be it. It'll make that up there taste that much sweeter if I have to endure a lot here. It's not easy. It's, it's not anything that you would willingly want to do. Nobody would willingly want to suffer. But the Bible says with much suffering, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. The, with much suffering, we must enter the heavenly realm. And so this life and all of its problems, not even to be compared. Paul said that. It's not even to be compared with the next one. It's not even on the radar. One minute in heaven. One minute with Jesus Christ, you'll forget all your troubles. One hour in heaven, you'll wonder why you ever doubted, why you ever questions. It won't even be a thought. All well, that life, I got a new one. And a million years from now, it'll still have that new life smell. 10 million years from now, it'll still have that new life smell. 100 million years from now, it'll still have that new life smell. Eons from now, and it will still be new to me. The brain cannot fathom the mercy and grace and love which with the Lord is showing us by opening up our understanding just a little bit, just cracking the lid so that we can go, wow, I can't see much, but I can see enough. That's amazing. Lord, we come before you this evening to bless you, praise you, honor you, glorify you, give thanks to you. I, I love what you're doing in that you're giving us a sneak peek. And I think this is something that's only for those who are real believers, only for those who are really are watching for you and longing for you and waiting for you. you. You crack the lid on everything, give us a sneak peek as to what's going on there. We find it in the scriptures, but even spiritually, we, we get this sensation of there's more and it's close. And I, it's almost like I can see a little tiny bit of it. I can see the light coming out from under the rim. And you, you constantly have been reminding us, especially with these devotions lately, reminding us there's a better life waiting, and it is nothing compared to this one. It is miles apart from what this life is. Don't worry about this life. Worry about the next one. Focus on me. Focus on the Word. Focus on what's coming. And you've been encouraging us and strengthening us and building us up. And Lord, things that are happening, it, here's the thing. All this stuff's happening. I am so tired. Um, the only other time I've ever been this level of tired, even close, was when I was in Iraq. And I was more tired then. But, but Lord, I can't help but think there's a better life waiting. And I just got to live out this life to get there. And this life and the time I spend here is nothing compared to that one. And so whatever we do here, whatever happens here, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it gets us closer to you. So if we have to endure losing loved ones, if we have to endure uh, caring for others, if we have to endure trials and troubles and hardships and all these things, it, all it does is make us want to be with you more. All it does is make, when that day comes, when we transition from here to there, when we meet you in the clouds and then go to heaven with you and, and have that triumphal entry, when all of heaven is waiting for us to get there. Because your word says all of creation, it includes heaven, it includes the angels, all of creation waits in expectation of the revealing of the sons of God. And we're watching for that day and waiting for that day. And we get that new body, no pain, no suffering, no nothing. And, and we make that run up and we step into the throne room. This life won't even be a speck on the radar. It won't even be anything compared to the next one. Lord, we have so much to look forward to, and I scarcely can get the words out properly to, to sh share my excitement over this, because this life, this life is what it is. I, I want to do what I can for everyone I can. It, sometimes it's a rough juggling act, like right now, we're, we're supposed to leave tomorrow morning on this trip, and everything is getting changed again, but we're used to it. But I know no matter what, there's something better. This is nothing and isn't even, let me put it this way, so everybody understands what those verses mean. When it says this life isn't even worthy to be compared to the next, this life isn't even worthy to be in the same universe as the next one. It is so inconsequential and insignificant when compared to the next life. 
-hmm. We can't even fathom it. We can't even grasp it. We can't even barely even imagine it. And that inspires massive hope and joy of knowing that it's coming and knowing that we play a part in it and knowing that we'll be there with you and with each other forever. Lord, help us to share this, this truth with everyone we can, believer and non-believer. Help us to plant some seeds of salvation in people. Help us to continue on, strengthen us, encourage us. Help us to continue doing what you've given us to do. No matter what happens, may we never look down, but instead look up to you because as long as we got our eyes on you, we walk on water. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful blessings. We love you. We praise you, we honor you, we glorify you. And in your name we pray, amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for evening devotion. In these trying times, like what I'm going through right now, and, and I really struggle to get the words out right, but in these trying times, I can't help but think about that. That is waiting on the other side. <clears throat> this life doesn't have to be all there is. This life doesn't have to be all that there, because if there's nothing after this life, there's no hope. With him, with Jesus Christ, there's something after this life, there's hope. Most people get to the point in their life nowadays, especially now in these last days, they get to the point where they're just like, I, just, I can't wait to die. I just can't wait to hurry up and just die and be done with this life. I'm so tired of constantly doing what I'm having to do and fighting and arguing and, and doing all these things and then Satan's holding me back. And they're just like, I'm just ready to go. I'm ready to be done with it. That's why suicide is so high. People finally get to the point where they're just like, they don't want to do it no more. Well, suicide isn't the answer. Jesus said, endure to the end. Somebody listening needs to hear this. Jesus said, endure to the end. No matter what happens, no matter what you see or experience, no matter what goes down, endure to the end. Because if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. And a greater entrance into heaven is waiting for you. Crowns are waiting for you. A place on his throne is waiting for you. Read Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the churches. Jesus said to him who overcomes. John says, who is he who overcomes? But he that believes Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And all that that implies. <laughs> and that's a lot. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.